facts are not persuasive. They're not. The social science about this is really interesting. If you just present somebody with facts that are contradictory to their core beliefs, they actually become more beholden to those core beliefs. Murph is bright, but she's been having a little trouble lately. She brought this in to show the other students. Yeah, that's one of my old textbooks. It's an old federal textbook. We've replaced them with the corrected versions. Corrected? Explaining how the Apollo missions were fake to bankrupt the Soviet Union. Let's say you'd like to land a man on Mars. 6% of Americans think the moon landings were faked, and another 5% aren't sure. If you wanted to sway those 11%, how would you go about doing it? By arguing over shadows in the photos of Apollo 11? Or whether a nylon flag was flapping in a breeze? Stanley Kubrick was involved faking the Apollo moon landing. 2001 Space Odyssey was a research project for the Apollo footage that was shot. This is the biggest medical to conspiracy cover up the and cover-up in the by history radiation. of medicine, George. It would be more productive to talk about the existence of ice on Mars, how that ice can be split apart into oxygen and hydrogen and combined with carbon from the atmosphere to make rocket fuel. Avoid debating the contentious past, which implies an error in judgment. Instead, focus on shared goals and technological solutions not yet dismissed. Where does advanced nuclear ultimately take us? Is it more appealing than drill baby drill and wind baby wind? President Kennedy didn't challenge the nation to launch humans into orbit around the moon for a flyby. The challenge was, specifically, to land on the moon. That was the difference between Apollo 8 and Apollo 11. Britain, they have the crown jewels. In America, we have moon rocks. <laughs> and as they say, it is priceless. It is. It is priceless. And the fact we haven't gone back makes it more priceless. First landing was at the Sea of Tranquility, Apollo 11. That was chosen because it was very close to the equator. It was a very, they thought it was a very safe site. As Neil Armstrong was approaching the landing site, though, he noticed there were boulders everywhere. And I mean, they didn't have maps that showed him that kind of detail. And he had to take over from the computer with very little fuel left. And he really piloted his way down. I mean, it's one of those stories where, sometimes you hear stories, you go, oh, that was overplayed for dram dramatic uh, effect. effect. No. <laughs> On Apollo 11, the more you learn about what really happened, the more scared you get. You go, this guy was in big, big trouble, and he pulled it out by sheer wow. ability. He was one of the best pilots the United States had, and, uh, and uh, he proved it that day on, on landing on the moon. He, he, pulled, he pulled the rabbit out of the hat. Apollo 11's touchdown was incredibly risky, and the slightest mistake would have resulted in Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stranded on the moon waiting to die. In 1962, one of these goals must have seemed far less audacious. In terms of driving technology forward, Apollo 8 would have been enough. Two major revolutions made the Saturn V possible and the moon landing possible. One was the decision to build a really big engine. It was a step change from what had come before. It is huge, over one million pounds of thrust, far bigger than anything anyone had ever comprehended before. The other revolution, liquid hydrogen on the second and the third stages. Liquid hydrogen is a very efficient fuel and it makes the rocket lighter. Now we look at it and it looks huge, it looks giant. But you have to remember this was actually an extremely lightweight design compared to what could have been. Moving humans safely in and out of lunar orbit drove life support and propulsion research. The computing requirements alone helped kickstart the microchip revolution. This is called the J2 engine. And this was the other great breakthrough of the Apollo program, which was to use hydrogen as a rocket propellant. No one had ever done that before. If you could do it, the benefit was tremendous fuel efficiency. The downside was you were starting from square one. It's highly explosive, it's highly explosive and it's super cold. And it's challenging all kinds of materials that uh, are fine dealing with kerosene. You take 400 degrees below zero, they don't have a prayer. So they had to go with all kinds of new materials, new seals, new gaskets, new piping, new... Everything was new to build the J-2 rocket. There was a part of Kennedy's speech I've always loved where he says, we will use new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, 
several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this and do it right, and do it first before this dictate is out, then we must be bold. Just grab me a color. A color exterior. There you go. Yeah, I'm looking for one. C-368. Anything, quick. We missed him. Hey, I've got it right here. That's, let me get out this one. A lot clearer. Apollo 8's lunar flyby produced Earthrise, the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. Apollo 8, an underappreciated Apollo mission. Most people have never heard of it. Apollo 8, what's that? Excuse me, that was the first time anybody ever left Earth. There was Earth, seen not as the map maker would have you identify it. No, the countries were not color-coded with boundaries. We went to the moon, and we discovered Earth. Apollo 8 was enough to change how we saw ourselves and spark an interest in science and engineering. Kids wanted to be astronauts long before we touched down on the moon. So why was the stated goal a risky Apollo 11 moon landing and not the more attainable Apollo 8 flyby. Because one could be articulated easily and leverage the nation's pop culture understanding of space travel. Apollo 8 was orbital mechanics and Delta V. Even today, Neil deGrasse Tyson is still explaining the difference between low Earth orbit and honest-to-goodness space. Textbooks, they have to fit the moon on the same page as the Earth. So you think moon is much closer than it actually is. Understanding what made Apollo 8 worthwhile was not a part of the culture. Apollo 11, that was stepping out onto an alien world. We got that. We'd read books about it, watched movies about it. You understood the implication the moment you heard it. Atomic power used to be communicated in such simple, visionary terms. It held the public's imagination back when it was explained as a source of energy which would become too cheap to meter, just like a good internet data plan. Despite the routine shutting down of domestic reactors and the deliberate sabotage of California's energy supply, there is still a pathway to abundant energy. But it cannot be achieved by solid fuel water-cooled reactors, because the only thing conventional reactors have to offer is electricity. The Westinghouse AP1000 nuclear power plant, a new generation of energy to power our homes and our businesses, designed to meet the world's growing need for electricity. Many nuclear advocates argue that a misled public and misdirected regulations have driven up the cost of nuclear power. I don't disagree, but whether nuclear can be a bit cheaper than coal or will remain perpetually more expensive, that's marginal. Slightly cheaper nuclear power is not a game changer. If CO2 were taxed, or if Westinghouse could lower the cost of each successive AP1000, or if anti-nuclear organizations were effectively called out on their misinformation, we'd still be stuck in a chicken and egg world where utilities lack the incentive to saturate the market with clean energy. And energy is too expensive to spark new industry, which could otherwise thrive. And it's not disruptive to the existing energy paradigm. And this is a core motivation of the environmental movement, is that we don't just want to replace Peter with Paul. There's a romantic vocabulary that goes with renewable energy. 
living in harmony with nature, it's safe, it's free, it's de democratic, it's localized, it has an overarching narrative to the renewable energy dream that's very attractive. We don't just want to replace fossil fuels with nuclear and have the same big centralized power plants and the same corporations. We want a revolution. We want to change the way the world works. Advocates for nuclear energy need to find that narrative, need to find that dream, need to have that positive overarching vision that goes beyond simply the technological aspect and saying, well, it's safe, you know, it's, or it's not that bad, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it's, not, it's not as dangerous as you think it is, right? But it's gotta, it's gotta be something more than that. What molten salt reactors offer is what even cutting edge water cooled reactors like AP1000 can't. Molten salt reactors produce more than just electricity. Molten salt reactors can be used in two ways. So they can be used as a form of electricity generation where it's being attached to the grid. And there are no constraints as to where you can site it. You don't even need it to be near water, which is often a constraint with existing nukes. So you can put it anywhere, really. So if there's a coal-fired power station that's running down, put your molten salt reactor at that point, and there's already the grid you need. So you're just swapping out the source of electricity. The grid's already there. And I think you know that's a perfectly viable way for it to go. But I think then also there's heat for industrial uses. You might actually see that come forward first, where these reactors are being sited at, on industrial complexes to provide heat, because there aren't that many sources of low carbon cheap heat. Oh, we have very high operating temperatures, up to 700 degrees. We can make almost that temperature in steam. Traditional nuclear water-cooled reactors, they're, they're warm, <laughs> uh, but running only 300 degrees Celsius, making steam that's, that's less than that, they just really have cut off so much of the potential markets. Ammonia, making ammonia, the Hubba-Bosch Bosch process, fractional distillation of crude oil, and catalytic cracking of, of those hydrocarbons. Those three things require temperatures above 450 Celsius. And those three industries are worth $2 trillion a year on this planet. So you have a little reactor at the industrial site, and then you just run a pipe of the salt. You have your fuel salt and the heat exchanger for clean salt, so it's not radioactive. And you can pipe the clean salt and use the heat directly. It also makes the whole thing cheaper because you save on the turbine, which is expensive. A great deal of the, of the price of the electricity will depend on the ability of the reactor to produce uh, coal products. With today's reactors, it's difficult to desalinate water. If you desalinate water, you take away from the electricity production of the reactor. In these reactors, because they're high temperature, there's a potential there to desalinate water. Put a great big power plant on the coast, bring in seawater from a couple miles out, desalinate it. Suddenly, you're not even pulling water out of the aquifers anymore. So the river's not touched, the lake's not touched, the aquifer's not touched. And, and anybody see how big the Pacific is recently? <laughs>